Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, Rumi Morales with CME Ventures, uh, Marley Gray with Microsoft, and Joe Lubin of Consensus. So blockchain, lots going on, tons of activity in the space, but generally still quite a bit of confusion about what it is and how things are actually going. So let's start out with kind of an overview of the state of play of blockchain for business today. How is it different than it was maybe six months to a year ago? Marley? I'll probably yeah. take a swag at that one. <laughs> so six months ago, it was. Um, sort of just help me stand up a blockchain. I want to stand up a private blockchain. So I, underneath what they're saying is I don't want to embarrass myself in public. Um, and everybody wants to do that. So there was this mad dash to set up these you know, places where people could play with it uh, to try to figure out you know, what they're going to do. Um, now, fast forward six months later, um, one of our goals was to make it ridiculously easy to, um, to roll these out, to either join a public blockchain or roll out your own private blockchain. And uh, so we made that really easy. Now we're at the next phase where now I've got this blockchain, what do I do with it? So we're kind of stuck on that piece right now. Um, so. Yeah, so uh, we started our company about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. But two years ago, uh, we started getting inquiries from um, companies, mostly banks uh, or financial space organizations. Uh, and they were very naive. They they didn't understand much. They thought blockchains came in different colors. And so uh, we, um, we did a lot of education early on. And we have found uh, incredibly rapidly that uh, within a wide variety of companies and sectors, the sophistication has grown enormously. Um, so one simple way of thinking about blockchain is as a next generation database system. So it's a kind of database system that everybody, every actor on the system can trust because they have direct access to the data and the programs that operate on the data, at least in the case of Ethereum. And so we see that as a, a sea change uh, for how businesses build systems, from, from building siloed information systems on legacy database technology to this new shared technology that everybody can trust. So, um, What do you think, Rumi? Is it becoming easier to use? Are, are companies starting to get it? Depends on the company, obviously, right? But I think this is a very interesting year. Last year, we saw a number of companies announcing things, that they would, they would be building things, or that they had a POC, or there's some type of use case. This is the year where they need to prove that, right? Are they going to go into production with it? Mm -hmm. Is this going to generate cost savings? Is this going to be a new business opportunity? But if it's not, I think you're going to have then like maybe like the anti-blockchain crowd start to have more of a voice in companies and say, hey, I thought this was supposed to be a miracle drug. Um, this hasn't generated what I thought it was going to do. We need to slow down our spending now. And I don't think that is the right response. This is going to be a long iteration. It's going to have a long life. Um, but I think it's going to, this is going to be a very interesting year to see whether the proof is in the pudding, as it were. Yeah, so, sure. So last year, um, POCs were the focus. Uh, this year, we've put uh, systems into production with a large uh, energy company, and, uh, and banks are putting some systems into production. And what does that process look like, going from cool idea, experimenting in the sandbox, to actual production? And what's the biggest hurdle to making that happen inside a company? <laughs> Well, I would say if like for so for many people I know they're like they've moved on to pulling out their eyelashes because they've done pulling out their hair, right? It's it can be very painful, especially if we think about some of the more uh, of the open source uh, blockchains that people are learning. This is not created to be, or was not originally created to be, financial infrastructure for these old legacy institutions that are hundred plus years old, right? So there's there's an inherent tension, and I, even if it's a private blockchain, people are still trying to figure out how is this going to fit in this old institution? So it's definitely uh, something that's taking time. Um, you know, from the CME's example, so for those not familiar with the CME, you may know a lot of our products a lot better, right? Whether it's gold or oil, um, soybeans, interest rates, equity stops, you know, the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board Trade, NYMEX, that's all under the CME group. And, um, you know, I have the privilege of leading the venture capital arm for the CME group. And early on, we recognized that this, you know, underlying technology would be very important for us, especially with clearing and settlement. So that's been a focus. 
but you can also think of our contracts. Our natural product is gonna, almost begs itself to be digitized, right? The same forces that went from pit trading to electronic trading are leading to electronic trading to digital trading. But how painful was that shift to electronic trading? It was pretty painful, right? Mm -hmm. And that pain is hopefully gonna be worth the gain, but it has been a, different, a difficult challenge, maybe from the investments that we're making to commercial production um, in the organization. Yeah. So the stress level depends on your industry, on your use case and your approach. Um, there are situate, basically the CME is a, a trillion dollar financial mission critical organization, so um, they have to be in, in, incredibly prudent. Uh, we rolled out a system for uh, a large uh, energy and mineral expor exploration company, BHP Billiton, and we set it up so that it would run in parallel with the existing infrastructure, and, and uh, um, it's essentially phase in more and more functionality over time, so mm -hmm. much less stressful approach. Yeah. Is there still this question circling around, do I get a private blockchain? Do I use the public blockchain? Do I have 10 blockchains in my company? Do I use just one? What's, where is that conversation move now, Marley? It's all over the map. So yeah, most of the enterprises, they'll start out with a private blockchain first, then they'll start looking at consortiums. Um, so we're, uh, we're all familiar with sort of in, in working to try to build like enterprise Ethereum alliances targeted at trying to help customers get into where they can build these uh, multi-party uh, consortium networks. And there'll be you know, duplicative ones that are in very siloed in, in vertical industries. But the true promise, and, and Joe and I talk about this a lot, is ultimately you know, trying to get the place where we can have business contracts, essentially, that, that weave together across verticals so we can have financial instruments weaved in with supply chain to, um, to, to have better terms of credit or to issue insurance mm. claims automatically based on uh, you know, actions that happen. So I think that sort of sort of interconnectivity begs to move things to the, the public blockchain, as well as things like identity, uh, self-sovereign identity, something that really needs to be in a, a public space. So I think what we'll see is you know, seeing the enterprises really focus on you know, figure the stuff out internally, so that they can go out and then start working with either their first competitors or um, you know, building in their supply chains, and then ultimately figuring out, okay, how do we uh, use the public blockchain with our existing investments so that we can really get the true value of, of what this technology can deliver. Yeah. So no, none of the public blockchains are sufficiently scalable yet mm -hmm. uh, to subserve the world's um, various different kinds of systems. So uh, similar to the early days of the World Wide Web technology and the internet, um, companies are going to have to build uh, on private permissioned infrastructure. Uh, and um, if they build on Ethereum, they'll be able to port their applications uh, to the public blockchain uh, when it's sufficiently scalable and when um, can, uh, confidentiality is figured out. Uh, until then, there um, are ways, are interesting ways of, of building applications on private or consortium blockchains and linking them. You can either validate transactions across different blockchains. We've got a project uh, uh, that's working on that or, or just taking the state of the system and basically um, hashing it, uh, creating a single number from it that roughly represents the state and putting that on the public blockchain for checkpointing. So it seems like if you're doing blockchain inside a company, you sort of need to be aware of the entire landscape right now, and it's, it's quite busy. Uh, you mentioned, Rumi, when we spoke earlier this week that you're kind of blanketing the universe of blockchain with your investments. What, how do you describe that approach, and how does that work in practice? I guess this is one of the advantages of being in, in venture capital is you don't have to take just one bet for the future. You're expected to take many, right? And especially on a, in, in a universe uh, in the blockchain landscape where we're still not show, sure which roads are headed where, why don't we try to take them all, right? But you, def you definitely have to have a different, I think a fundamentally differentiated view of how the chain is gonna be created. So early on, we thought about the bones of our organization 
and how those could be interpreted in a digital world. Now, obviously, we couldn't invest as a company in Bitcoin blockchain, right? But our first investment in this space was in Ripple, and we were very interested in their distributed ledger technology um, as an alternative um, to the Bitcoin blockchain. This was three years ago. So we've been actively immersed in this space as a corporate investor. I don't care what Fred Wilson says <laughs> about all of us being dumb money, or maybe I should care, but I think that we've been prudent here in our analysis of the opportunities in blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, we also saw another um, view of the world in digital asset holdings with you know, what, and what Blythe Masters is doing, specifically creating you know, capital markets infrastructure with a private blockchain as another alternative path for a future. But then quickly realized we couldn't do this with every single one, um, but we, so we then invested in a digital currency group. And so for those familiar with DCG, um, they have equity stakes in around 100 companies, I think, at this point, uh, in addition to invest, uh, owning Coindesk, Genesis, and Grayscale. So we have that universe covered from um, an investment exposure and strategic access. At the same time, though, you know, we are members of the uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, or is it Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, sorry, um, <laughs> and Hyperledger, right, as well as uh, the Post-Trade Distributed Ledger Group, um, and members of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, so focusing on regulatory protection, too, and regulatory policy and driving that universe. You know, it's, there's still so much unknown, and right now we're trying to take every road possible um, as we explore um, what will ultimately work for the CME. But I, I will conclude by saying this. When it comes then to actually developing commercial applications, we, na we focus narrow, narrowly into you know, exactly what our, our most specific pain points and or what our customers are going to want. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we have a Bitcoin real-time index and reference rate which we publish, but we also have announced that we're going to be developing a digital gold product with the Royal Mint, and there, it's, a, it's a very defined uh, task that we have ahead of us there. Right. There are so many visions for the blockchain future, and knowing exactly what it's going to look like sometimes seems like a, a fool's game, but one thing that comes up all the time is standards and who's going to set the standard. We have so many groups who are working together, the Ethereum Alliance being one of those, to, to try to figure out what blockchain is going to look like. The World Economic Forum put out a white paper today calling for a, a global standards group um, that starts to look at how this impacts not only companies but the rest of the world. Everyone's sort of competing for influence. How do you see the standards making coming together over the next two years, three years? Hopefully they don't come together over the next two or three years because that'll be a very immature technology. Um, we, it's really early, uh, early days in, in the exploration of blockchain. Um, and there's a vast solution space that we and many other groups uh, need to explore. Uh, so um, there, are, there are certain pieces that are great to standardize on. Um, uh, one thing that drove enormous growth in the token launch space is uh, 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 ERC-20 um, uh, token standard on Ethereum. So just because um, this standard specified uh, what a token should look like in terms of data and, and the methods that, it, that that piece of software responds to, um, uh, then it can be used uh, in a bunch of different programs on the blockchain, in wallets, in exchanges, and uh, um, it's really made it easy to, to drive growth in that space. Identity is another really important one to try to get right early because it's foundational. Um, Microsoft, Consensus, a handful of other groups uh, formed the Decentralized Identity Foundation to, to try to work out those issues. Yeah, in terms of blockchain in general, um, blockchains two, five, ten years from now are going to look totally different. Yeah, it's way too early for standards. We, we're still, it's, it's one thing to standardize on a protocol and say, oh, we're going to agree on this message format. But this technology is actually changing the DNA of, potentially changing the DNA of how everyone here does business, mm -hmm. and both at a corporate and a personal level. Um, because it's not just distributed data. I mean, we're talking about distributed everything. Uh, distributed cost, distributed risk, distributed. So it changes not only the business models, um, we're still having to figure out the, how does the technology map to the business model and probably how does the business model adjust to what the technology cap capabilities are. And we haven't figured that out yet. If you try to standardize something, it's like you know, casting your die before you know uh, what it is you're making. So 
Have there been business models that you've seen or certain applications that you've seen that seem the most promising in terms of actually making that leap over? There's some killer apps that we, we see across industries. So every industry, you can, and, and really, if, if anybody has a specialty in any industry, you talk, you know, everyone thinks, ah, here's the killer app. So it's a major pain point. Um, but those are usually either, uh, we call it the, the fear bucket or the greed bucket. Um, and then there's this middle bucket, which we don't know what it's going to be. That's like trying to say, predict Facebook back in 1995. You know, who would have known? But um, yeah, some of the use cases we see are uh, the early ones are around asset issuance, prominence, and, mm -hmm. and, and trading. But I think the more sophisticated ones will be these uh, cross industries where you have banks working with supply chain organizations, working with um, uh, the insurance uh, companies, and to really come up with a, an automated, sort of uh, very efficient mm -hmm. uh, ecosystem. And, and really, it's all about uh, its, its core is supply chain. Every organization has a supply chain. It's not just industrial supply chain. It's uh, you have trading partners. You buy goods from people. And you sell goods from to other organizations. And you know, that is going to, if you do that, which everybody does, it's going to change the way your business works. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, on the product side of our company, uh, we have about 30 different projects. Uh, two projects that I think this group might be able to resonate with. Uh, one is in the advertising technology space. Um, uh, on the internet, uh, uh, the amount of fraud uh, in uh, ad placement uh, is shocking. It's, pro you're, it's probably 70%, could be higher, in terms of the number of uh, impressions that are paid out to uh, fraudulent uh, entities. Uh, so uh, we, we're building a system that is designed to squeeze fraud out of that space. On the energy front, we're working with one of the largest energy companies in the world to build a transactional business logic layer on top of the decentralizing electricity industry. So photovoltaics, storage uh, are getting cheap uh, and decentralizing physically worldwide. Uh, there's recognition that centralized generation, long distance transmission uh, is brittle um, and vulnerable and inefficient. And so um, we have built uh, a network of smart batteries uh, that are attached to photovoltaics. The batteries are connected on a blockchain that es essentially represents a market. So the batteries themselves can put bids out for electricity, or if they're topped up, they can offer electricity uh, into that market. Um, and this kind of application enables time shifting of energy use. So um, the sun is up at a certain uh, time of day, and you collect energy. Um, and uh, we can shift uh, usage, say factory usage, uh, to other points in time uh, using this technology. It, it prevents uh, the need to spin up, uh, say, billion dollar peak fur plants uh, to handle uh, peak load in, uh, say, hot days in the summer. Mm. So it sounds like blockchain is starting to kind of converge on a lot of other technologies that many of you probably are thinking about, if not actively working with Internet of Things, AI, things like that. How, how does this convergence start to happen? Rumi, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. And we, I, I neglected to mention one company as well that we've invested in this space, because I think about it more as an IoT company, um, but it's Filament. Mm. And you know, Filament really wants to be um, you know, kind of like the, the future communications platform slash payments platform for the Internet of Things, right? And you can use blockchain as a rail for that payment for devices that are going to be talking with each other. And I think where blockchain is very relevant with Filament is, you know, this is naturally um, something where decentralization is very important. And to your earlier question about standards and why is it too early, I think we really have to be very, very specific about the definition of blockchain if we're going to be talking about standards. If for so many you know, companies and governments that are saying, oh, yes, let's use the blockchain, many times they're just looking for an encrypted database. Like They really don't want any of the charm of decentralization at all. right? Mm -hmm. um, so for, for us, as we think about um, applications of the future and those technologies um, that are going to interact with blockchain, I think decentralization has to be a very key component of that 
and something like IoT makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but in CME Ventures, generally, you know, blockchain is one part of our investment portfolio. It is all arise filled with a lot of um, specific verticals under the artificial intelligence umbrella, as well as geospatial data. IoT and so on and so forth. And we see a lot of convergence amongst these. And ideally, there won't be buzzwords like blockchain and AI machine learning. You want to see some type of combination before that next buzz buzzword exists mm -hmm. of the way that these technologies are interacting with each other. Sure. Marley, how about at Microsoft? I know there's some IoT work going on. Where do IoT and blockchain start to meet one another? Oh, so yeah, so blockchain is sort of the dot connector uh, between all of these different components that sort of uh, and you start to compile these components together, so you've got IoT devices and AI and machine learning, and, and you can use blockchain to create systems and tie these things together with, with, with cryptography to, to, to define processes of how these things orchestrate together securely. Mm -hmm. IoT is one of the biggest things that, in IoT was the, how do we secure uh, this internet of things that could, you know, my, how my car would cut off, or you know, how do we how do we secure that? And you know, cryptography is going to be you know, very key in doing that. But you have to have sort of end-to-end, -end, well, not sort of, you need end-to-end -end security. And um, so, you know, blockchain provides um, that sort of common truth that everyone can agree on. And, uh, you know, I think you know, what we're uh, trying to build is the cloud and IoT kind of go together to help deliver that truth and make that truth actionable to things like IoT, uh, where it can become a trusted participant, where things like IoT devices can report into a supply chain that you know, the temperature of uh, this crate went up above you know, the, this uh, degree, and the, the shrimp in there is bad, so <laughs> issue an insurance policy. Your insurance claim on this uh, shrimp, and make sure you discard it when it gets to port. Okay. That kind of stuff. And that, that enabling uh, is the coordination of you know, the IoT devices reporting up through the cloud into the blockchain and, and decisions being made and rules being defined. Mm. Joe, do you get the sense that companies are warming up to the idea of decentralization? Are they becoming more cooperative? Uh, legacy companies are not in the business of decentralization. Although um, a Canadian messaging platform uh, called Kik uh, mm -hmm. is jumping into the token launch space. And uh, um, so they're, they're embracing it to some degree, at least. But uh, um, companies are using blockchain for efficiency and because it uh, enables new kinds of use cases that uh, they weren't previously uh, able to consider. Um, shared sources of truth for reference data would be one, one simple example. Um, while all of that excellent activity is going on, there are many companies, new companies and projects around the world that are uh, envisioning new ways of doing things that are more decentralized. What do you think, Rumi? More cooperation? Is, it, is decentralization a concept that companies are warming up to? I think I began my first answer saying it depends on the company. I'll <laughs> just say again, it depends on the company, for sure. Um, but I think, in general, Open source is something that they're, they're warming more up to, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just in the blockchain space, but generally. And this notion of um, you know, a collaboration in technology development is uh, generally getting more and more accepted, I think, within organizations. So I think that will lead to influence, like perhaps greater decentralization, but it's still going to probably take some time yet. Yeah. Sure. So one, one aspect of decentralization uh, could be considered sharing. Uh, and so. Uh, supply chains, uh, information infrastructure for sectors or industries, uh, those things have now become possible because all those cooperating and competing actors can use the same shared infrastructure. So, uh, yeah, bigger companies may evolve to, to being more collaborative at least. Sure. Well, we've got a few minutes left. I want to talk about the other side of this, uh, cryptocurrencies, um, and most recently all that we've been hearing about uh, ICOs. I was pretty surprised uh, in a good way to see a front page story in the New York Times the other weekend on the ICO boom. How do you, how do you start to think about ICOs? Are these unlocking new opportunities? Is it too early, too dangerous? What's the, what's the general approach to these things right now? Yeah, so um, 
token launches. We prefer to call them token launches based on legal <laughs> advice. Um, uh, they are thawing an enormous amount of frozen global capital. It's hard to make an investment in a company in the Western world. I have to be an accredited investor in most cases. Um, token launches enable smart college students to put 100 bucks into something that they care about. Uh, or it enables a couple smart college students to do permissionless VC, uh, to put their pitch out on the internet and, uh, and uh, uh, sell some tokens um, to fund maybe a, a first phase of development of a project. Um, so it, uh, never in history have we had a platform that uh, had its own built-in money, uh, had its own ability to build financial instruments on that money, mm -hmm. had its own ability to construct uh, funding mechanisms for projects. Uh, so that, that sort of dynamic uh, sets up an enormous number of positive feedback loops, and I, I think that will drive uh, um, a network effect like we've never seen. Yeah. We're essentially talking about crypto derivatives. I mean, uh, this yeah. network lets you build just about anything. I think, you know, it's, it's early days. Uh, everybody, we've been selling. We're we not going to stop saying that. <laughs> but for uh, initial token launches, um, you, you know, the, we're going to learn a lot about how, how they work. I imagine there's going to be a couple turns of that crank before we get it really right. And I'm sure that you know, regulatory bodies will have something to say about uh, what point does it become a security versus a, um, and we, that's a bridge we're, are going to have to cross at some point, uh, but I think right now, you know, the, it's still so, we, we're not really sure what, what it's going to do, but it's tremendously interesting. Um, and I think, you know, anyone that, even organizations looking at this can, and uh, even if you're not trying to raise funds, it's an interesting concept that you can apply to other things like loyalty and um, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, other types of programs. Rumi, could you see CME doing a, an ICO for an in-house project? <laughs> I will say this about token launches. This is where I become very old-fashioned suddenly. Um, but I, I, I won't say, well, shut it down or stop it. I don't think anyone should, because then you're saying shut, shut down innovation or stop innovation. And it's, it's, I think it will be important to see iterations of this. And I've been actually been fascinated by the hybrid model of companies that have raised money traditionally and are now also doing some token launches, like Brave being one of them. It's like, well, well, doesn't that make sense then? Don't you want to incentivize people to actually use and get paid for using your product, right? It should be, a, a, I, I kind of like that mutual back and forth idea. But I think until we see more uh, proven companies start to uh, have token launches, not you know, token launches and then trying to go prove a company, um, I'm still, like, like these gentlemen as well, just watching with wide eyes. Right. Um, I'm curious to the extent that you think, uh, you know, do large corporations that are experimenting with blockchain, what level of influence do they have in the overall development of the technology? Are there, can a corporate come in and really change the direction of how this is being built up, or is it another group that really has the most influence? Yeah, so uh, public blockchain, in particular Ethereum, um, leads the way in, in terms of defining that technology. Uh, the uh, different uh, independent but cooperative groups uh, around the world that are building clients uh, for the Ethereum protocol, uh, they really set their own direction. Uh, the, the problems that you solve uh, when you're dealing with the most malicious situation, the, the public uh, permissionless case, are much more rigorous than what you face in an enterprise context. And so the hard problems need to be solved there. So they have to lead. Um, and then once they've led, once they've solved those hard problems, created uh, a very powerful system uh, in a Byzantine context, uh, the, the most challenging context where up to half of the actors on the system could be malicious, um, then you can take that technology and move it into a consortium or a, or a corporate context. Uh, you have strong governance in those situations. You can relax assumptions. You can make optimizations, uh, increase um, security with weaker kinds of consensus algorithms and make it run really fast and more easily. I think we're going to have to see it. We'll see it in there, there, there as well. But the enterprise, like the enterprise Ethereum Alliance, um, 
we're looking at privacy. You know, how do you make sure that private uh, data between two counterparties is only visible to those two counterparties and the regulatory oversight? Um, so that in performance, we'll have different. Um, but I think one of the things that we do kind of uh, in, in the, the two spaces is we don't want to do those in, 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 in isolation. So have the public you know, um, sort of trustless network sort of define that um, and fix those hard to solve problems in that Byzantine environment where the enterprise can really focus on sort of the illities, the operations, manageability, scalability, all that, all that stuff. And you know, make sure that this can work together um, as we start to see the vision of the public and the private blockchains working together to create this new economy. Yeah, you may not see corporations lead with brains, right, as thought leaders, but they probably will lead with brawn, you know, and uh, you, you see this in their, the consortiums, and once they all decide to adopt something en masse, I think it will be very powerful. Great. It's well, an open source technology. There's, there's no way to buy it. it cat's right. out of the bag already. Right. Uh, and there's really no way to influence a uh, globally decentralized uh, set of hackers who believe strongly in, in decentralization. Good point. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time, guys. I um, appreciate it. We'll see if we're having another blockchain panel next year or if we'll be mainstream. Mainstream. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.